Hey, everybody. What's up? So I was fortunate enough to get Brent on. And um, so he has a fascinating background. But first off, thank you for taking the time to, you know, hop on, chat with me a little bit and share some of your experience. Sure. Good to see you. And um, there's definitely a good synergy between trading and people with military backgrounds. In fact, uh, two of the best traders that so I've had I've been a manager a lot at various banks. And two of the best traders that ever worked for me were both military backgrounds. So not a coincidence. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it makes sense to me in a lot of ways, though, just because of the discipline. I think that that's such a big thing, um, which, you know, I think, except- yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things that the discipline and then also I think the stakes don't feel as high. Like if you've been in the military and then you come yeah. to trading, it's like, yeah, OK, it's scary to, you know, whatever is going to happen to your P&L. But it's not comparable to real life, you know, military situations. <laughs> and uh, needless to say. And then also, um, maybe this is just more of like a quirk, but generally people that come to Wall Street from the military are older and more mature. Mm. So it's not like a 22 year old like Quant who's, you know, never been out of their parents' backyard in, in their life, you know, like so they're generally military people that come to Wall Street are just more you know, adult. And I'm not saying that, that I was, cause I was very immature when I came to wall street, but, um, and so that was probably a weakness of mine, but a lot of military people come, you know, as adults that are mature and, and kind of ready to sit down and get to work. So. Yeah. It's an interesting observation. Cause I, I, I do find that a lot just in terms of the scale of the perception of risk mm-hmm. is really important. Cause yeah, uh, I think a lot of retail traders focus a lot on if they're actually developed retail traders, they focus on risk a lot. Mm. But I think a lot of people forget the other side of that equation, you know, that reward is tied to risk. And a lot of people become really risk averse, then you can't really make any money if you're too risk averse. And yeah, that's interesting. I don't know if you want to get started, like go right into this or I'm like, I'm, it, there's it, literally no format. So whatever okay, you want to call it. I don't it know about. if I'm like yeah. hijacking your intro or whatever. Not at but, all. Um, but one interesting thing that I found is so like, I'm a very risk loving person. Like I took a lot of stupid risks as an adolescent and just like, I've always been a risk taking person. And so that has generally for me been harnessed in trading by like rules and, and systems and things like that. Right. And so as a manager, when I was like 30 or so, I started managing people and I started managing more and more people. And the biggest surprise or one of the biggest surprises to me was how risk averse people actually are. And I kind of thought, oh, everyone must be like me. I'll just need these rules to like pull the reins back on everyone. And actually most of the guys that, and I'm saying guys, not all men work for me, but mostly men and some women. But but actually the women that work for me were more risk seeking. So whatever that means. Um, But (laughs) a lot of the guys that work for me, I had to actually institute rules to force them to take more risk because Mm. their risk would would be, their positions would be too small or they were always like, there's two ways of being risk averse. One is your positions are too small and and you can't pull the trigger. That's kind of like the textbook thing, right? Like I can't, can't always waiting for the perfect trade and all that. Yeah. Um, But then there's another form of it, which is people that put on risk, but then just always want to take it off. So like any excuse, like, Oh, the price action, you know, it should have gone down by now. And, and that kind of like, there's a lot of traders that will just make a million excuses because it's the having the risk that makes them nervous, not the putting it on. So right. I found that really interesting when I started becoming a manager on Wall Street was that actually 80% of people are risk averse. And what you really wanted was like the 22 year old analyst that came in and like where I was like, dude, you're taking way too much risk. This is insane. Like that's that was very rare. And that's what I was. So I, you know, you when you don't know the world that well, which I didn't, you just think everyone's kind of like you, but obviously that's not the case. So everyone, I think like a really important thing in this whole dialogue is being really self-aware about what your thing is. Like, you know, are you risk averse? Are you like, what are you good at? And what are you not good at? And like, for me, one big breakthrough I had was acknowledging so like everyone wants to like get better, right? Like self-improvement and that that's sort of like the, the, the um, sorry, like the, the growth mindset and all that is like, I'm not who I am now, or I am who I'm now, but I can be anything through improvement and stuff. 
And I think that philosophy kind of like dominates education and a lot of trading education as well. But the reality is that some things you cannot change. And that was actually a big breakthrough for me was instead of saying like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to be more disciplined. I'm definitely going to like follow my rules tomorrow was that mentality didn't work for me because the next day, like I'd make the same mistake again. Right. So the mentality actually that helped me a lot was, okay, my self-discipline sucks, like my, or my self-control sucks. So instead of trying to fix it, like now, I'm whatever, like in those days I was, when I made this kind of leap or whatever, I was probably 30, 33 or something. I'm like, okay, I'm 33 years old. My, my self-control still sucks. So what am I going to do about it? And then when I acknowledged it and then started putting in systems and, and like basically automating more of my risk management and stuff like that, that was like a big leap for me was like, instead of putting the, having the chips in the cupboard, in the closet and saying like, okay, right. I'm definitely not going to eat the chips tonight. It's better to just not have the chips in the closet in the first right. or in the cupboard in the first place. You say cupboard or closet. I'm Canadian. Well, Sometimes I, are, I was going to say, you, you must be Canadian. So here, we, yeah, we, we would go with, closet if it's pantry? like a big one you, a pantry is a big pantry. one yeah maybe pantry was the word i was looking for maybe every now and then in the i slip of in pantry yeah i like the other night i actually said uh or i was in actually a boardroom and i you know there's food there and i was getting a water and i said anybody want to pop and like oh, the friggin silence in that room holy crow um, no but i anyways. try to I have a few mis Midwest friends and they'll, they'll go with pop. And it, it's always at least, I mean, these are friends I've been friends with for a decade and I'll, I'll fight with them for 10 minutes. Every time pop is a sound pop is a noise. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I've been in the U S since 06. So I've like cleared most of these ticks by now, but uh, you know, they, they still sneak back, but anyways, um, I'll, give, I'll give you the mic back, but um, yeah, the, the whole, the whole spectrum of uh, from like risk averse to risk seeking is really interesting. And I think like knowing your own place on that spectrum and trying to move to a more appropriate point on the spectrum, but then also knowing like there's only so far you can move yourself because your fundamental, like who you are is somewhat anchored, you know, like it's not completely, it's definitely not fixed, um, but it is somewhat anchored. And then so understanding that I think is useful. I absolutely agree with you. When you see me put my head down, I'm just taking some notes because yeah, I no actually, problem. I actually really want to talk about that risk to reward spectrum a little bit later. Um, so for general context, um, I want to talk a little bit about your background. So from my understanding, you started at Citibank at the FX desk. Yes. Yep. That's right. Yep. I started Bingo. in 19, 1995. 95. Yeah. Yep. And then you worked at the spot desk for a bit and then you decided that you were the next Steven Spielberg. So you wanted to go into film yep. and then that had um, mixed outputs. So then it was a subsequent rotation back to floor trading. Good so far. Yeah. It wasn't really floor trading. It was more like the term people usually use is bucket shop, but it wasn't a bucket shop. It. it was like a professional day trading place, you know, that, that many of those existed in the late 1990s. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of doing the creative thing, which the, the most like the peak of that success was like we had a cartoon on TV in Canada for like two years. Yeah, that's right. Um, what was it called? Daft Planet? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So Bingo. I was doing that and trading the NASDAQ bubble um, at the same time. So yes, anyways, hundred percent accurate so far. <laughs> All right. Um, and I even got the cartoon name. I'm pretty, yeah, that's on pretty that good, good research. Chops. I, I watched a couple episodes of it actually on, on YouTube. It's like, it's, it's actually really good. I think so, that, the, go ahead, I think go ahead. that the, I think that the timing was rough because I know that South park was getting big in the mid nineties. Um, and they did, you know, they, they took a lot of limelight, but I like, I don't know the humor that you guys have in there is I, I think like really well, really well done. So it's actually the opposite. So South Park helped us because oh, the, the sort of like way in animation in that time was basically like script and story over animation quality because South Park's okay. animation quality was low, like intentionally yeah. the bar to make like a, a show wasn't as high. So like our, our show was actually the first one, uh, the first animated TV show made in Flash. Like remember Flash? 
I don't, but no. Okay. Flash was like a, a program that was used mostly for online animation. Okay. And so our show was the first, so it's still like cost like 250 grand an episode, but that was cheap at the time for, for a show. Got um, it. So yeah, but the business model generally in Canada for, for a lot of artistic things is you got to sell it in the U S within like a year or two. Cause that's like oh, really interesting. The, the economies of scale in the Canadian market being like one tenth the size of the U S aren't right. That great, like depending on what the thing is. Um, and then when you release in the U S you get like the big marketing halo and all that, because the U S TV and, and rate like not radio now, but the TV and, and print and all that, like all kind of flows back into Canada. So, mm -hmm. um, so anyways, we never sold it in the U S so I'll let you continue. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's interesting background though. So then, um, after that is when you said that you were trading the, the NASDAQ bubble. Is that accurate? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then you did some time in hedge funds after that mixed hedge funds. I know that you worked at a couple places, HSBC and, um, I think what city also, or is that, am I making yes, that so I went back to city again. Okay. Um, so basically what happened was like, this is, this is relevant to, to trading. So I'll, yeah. I'll tell you a little bit more detail was around like 2000, right around the cusp of when the bubble peaked, I think like April, 2000, I think was the peak March, April, 2000. Um, it was getting harder to do what I was doing, but it was still fine. So Mostly my strategy was I had a, a, in those days you had a, like the S and P pit was still a thing, like the actual pit in yep. Chicago or whatever. So I had a, like a, a feed, like a earphone, whatever to the, to a guy, the squawk from the pit. And you could kind of get a sense of like when S and P's were bid and when they were heavy and all that. And then I had like eight stocks on my screen that were all like high absolute value stocks. So like stocks trading from 100 to $500 a share. And when you could feel like bullish energy in the pit in the S and P's, you get on. I get on the bid in all the stocks. So if it was a hundred, and some of them were trading pretty wide, like 100, 102, say, like some of the the shitty tech stocks were trading. Yeah. That wide. So I'd go at that time it was fraction. So I'd go 100 and one eighth bid, and there was enough retail back and forth. Sometimes you'd get filled, but in a in a moment where like S and P's were kind of ticking higher, so you know obviously that was a good time to be getting filled on the bid. And then you just try and offer them out at 101 and seven eighths right away. Got it. And so part of that was every morning I printed a, a thing of all the stocks over a hundred. Cause that was kind of what was necessary because you didn't want to be trading a stock that was at like five bucks, like sun microsystems or something. Cause you had to do so many shares, you know, when the spreads were smaller, what you want right. was like high absolute value and low volume because the commission was, the, was a big thing in those days. So like it was, a much easier to be gross positive but obviously you had to be net positive so you wanted to pay as little bro as you could in those days it actually mattered a lot so anyways what kind of leverage of just sorry just out of curiosity what kind of leverage were you using if you were i mean you're taking for what like a point ride or something like that yeah so like not very much like okay. I, my i opened my account with 25 grand and i think we only had two to one two to one margin i'm pretty sure oh okay so yeah margin. interesting um so uh, yeah. So in the morning I would print out a sheet of all the stocks over a hundred and it was like four pages long. And so in O2, this is when, when things started going pear shaped for me, when I printed that thing out in the morning, there was four stocks on it. So <laughs> like the absolute value of the stocks had collapsed. So my churn rate was going up a lot. So right. almost every day I'd still be gross positive, but a lot of days now I was net negative because of the brokerage. So I would make four grand, like say I'd make uh 3,800 bucks, and my commission would be 4,200 or whatever. And, you know, that's a lot of work to make. And, you know, I don't know if those numbers, are, that that's probably on the high side, but, you know, but some days I'd make, you know, whatever. Anyway, so I was kind of like, it was getting more and more difficult to make money. And then what killed me was decimalization came in um, at that time as well. And then all the spreads just went like after that. So like things that were trading two bucks wide were now like there was all these little shitty bids and offers in there all, on all the pennies. So the, it was a really good lesson for my like broader career. Um, so basically like I took my account from like 25 grand to three fifth to 350,000. And like, I made way more than that. Cause I paid my taxes. I bought like an M3 out of that. I paid my rent for, I was out of like, I was doing that basically for five years. Um, except the TV show, I got paid a little bit. 
Um, so like I did really well, but then starting when basically the day decimalization happened, I never adapted and I never really found a new way to trade. And so my equity started going bleh, like slowly, slowly down. And I was just basically bleeding every day. And I, I could kind of feel like, okay, this isn't happening anymore. Like, I don't know what I'm, I don't know how to make money anymore. Um, so, and it coincided, a whole bunch of things happened. So the show got canceled uh, right around that same time as decimalization. And then I met my wife. So I was like, eh, I kind of wouldn't mind having like a real job now. Like I've been partying and trading for five years. It's kind of like yeah. time to be an adult. And also I had been out for almost five years. So I thought like if I'm, I still had people that I knew that I'd worked with and stuff. So I was like, if people, if someone wants to hire me, you know, after five years, that's going to be a miracle. But like after seven or eight years, people are just going to say like, dude, you've been gone too long. Nobody knows who you are. Right. <laughs> so I decided at that time to then go back into, into trading. So back into FX trading. But the, the reason that I left, part of the reason I left originally was Market making was 100% flow in the 90s. It was just like right. super transactional. Busy, sell 100, buy 50. And basically you're just trying to keep track of your position and like yeah. take all the crumbs and make 100 grand and be happy. And now, so like now fast forward to 2022, almost all the market making is automated. Like especially right. in what I do, which is spot FX is the most commoditized of all of the, it's one of the most commoditized products really in the world most liquid and commoditized products, even more than like probably Apple stock. Um, so, but actually what that opened up was a lot of opportunities for the job to be a lot more interesting. So now the job is much more about like talking to clients, almost acting like a consultant, mm -hmm. excuse me. And then also writing about macro and being more strategic, trying to take positions and, and like forecast the market and like kind of what I always thought trading really was um, as opposed to what market making is, which is executing transactions for external counterparties, which wasn't, I didn't never found very much fun. Um, but the downside of that is that like when I started at city in 1995, the spot spot is like, you know, two day settlement currency trades. So normal right. currency trades that people think of like, you know, I'm buying Euro, I'm selling dollar yen or whatever that spot. And the spot desk at City New York was 30 people when I started. And now like most spot desks are three, three people because um, computers can do most, almost all the trades. Right. So you, as a market maker in FX now, you basically do like the huge trades and you, you know, take risk based on what you think is going to happen, like based on where you think the market's going. And then you talk to clients and it's, so it's more of like, almost like a hybrid like what I've developed into is more like a hybrid sales trading um, and research kind of like, I don't know, I was going to say triple threat, but that sounds way too. Uh, it sounds very <laughs> sexy. It, yeah, it yeah sounds way cool. too sexy, way yeah. more sexy than I am. Um, <laughs> so, but like, you know, I think that's, that's kind of like the people that work at banks that are, that are succeeding now on, on desks a lot of them are doing that more like more hybrid role where you're talking to clients and taking risk, but then also um, doing more like researchy kind of stuff. And then some are actually doing quant stuff as well, which uh, th that's not really my area. Like I'm, I'm functional in Excel and stuff, but I'm not like applied math guy. Mm, got it. Yeah. I've had a couple people that I've worked with and um, actually my best friend is kind of a super nerd when it comes to Excel and sometimes I feel proficient, but then I do stuff around them and then I just feel like an idiot. So, yeah, 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 same here. Like when the V lookup's not doing what you wanted it to do and you're like, yeah, I'm pretty uh, yeah. sure I learned that like the first cl first class, but I, but, I still you know, you don't have to worry about it because there's some six year old on YouTube that can walk you right through it, yeah. you know, and then yeah, you're just true. like, sick, this kid is in middle school teaching me <laughs> how to do Excel. I'll just cut and paste his code straight into Excel. Yeah. <laughs> So one of my main questions, I think I was telling you before we started, um, yep. I, I did trade some, some FX when I was in college. So I started trading when I was in high school, but it was mostly just stock. And then I, you, cause I didn't have any money. It was like three, $5,000, three to 5,000, not 35,000, 35,000 yeah. in high school would have been sick. Um, but anyways, you know, I, I didn't have much money. And then in college I came across 
FX and I, for a while FX was at least on the retail side was was kind of a big deal because it seemed like there was this thought that it was fast easy money that was like the general messaging around it and you know I thought fast easy money that sounds that sounds like me sign yes, me please. up please yeah right yeah and then and then I realized it was like you know lose your money fast and easy was probably a better yeah moniker for it cuz I was trading it for a little bit I had moderate success at best and it was not worth the time, you know, for what, what I was trying to get out of it. And yeah. I would love to know other than you just starting in, you know, FX, when you first kind of got into the markets, what's kept you there? Why FX, why not futures on equities? Why not other products? What's kept you there? Well, so my kind of like interest was always more macro than micro, mm -hmm. like in terms of economics and all that. Um, I wouldn't say that like I was super thoughtful and strategic about Got where it. I ended up. I was like 22 and I kind of ended up in FX some like not totally randomly, but kind of like I had a couple choices and I picked it. And but the reason that it appeals to me is that there's so many like there's just this constant ebb and flow of new narratives like a lot of what i do is kind of around narrative sentiment positioning trying to understand like kind of what the crowd's doing and then being ahead of it and you know i have more of an edge in that now than i used to because like i just because i know a lot of people and i talk to a lot of people um but even when i was starting out i think i always liked the macro like the kind of like on like unchanging or sorry continuously changing narratives like this crazy puzzle that's so complex that it can never be solved and like just when you think you've solved it you know all the rules change and it, those things you thought matter don't even matter whereas like to me like dcf and 10ks and stuff like that never really appealed to me as much um because i'm just more into like macro and behavioral stuff so like i i think and then like the approach that I use in terms of like behavioral stuff, um, I think would work like works across asset classes. But generally, I think it's so hard to make money trading that you really just have to like become expert on your thing. And like you can understand and watch other things and maybe incorporate other asset classes into your into your framework. But I feel like so like my my guess would be that like if you're succeeding in what you're doing now in equities, if you had devoted the same amount of time to FX, you probably would have found your, your niche. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think it, there is some aspect, like I've described my kind of interest in economics and stuff was always more macro. So I think my personality is more like, I'm more likely to enjoy myself doing FX than, than doing like small caps just because it's more macro. But at the same time, you know, like, does that mean there's more like a greater chance I'd have an edge in it. I don't really think so. Like if I spent 10 years trading small caps, I think I could probably figure out my edge and it'd probably be something kind of different and maybe not as behavioral. But I think that's why I'm a big proponent of um, really like picking a thing and saying, okay, like I'm going to be as expert as I possibly can at this. And like I said, it doesn't preclude you from looking at other stuff or trading other stuff. Sure. Um, but, um, but yeah, like, so the question, I guess, is like, can people have an edge in FX? I think generally, you first of all, having an edge in any product is extremely difficult. And there's like so much empirical data that supports that. Yes. You know, what day traders and equities or FX or whatever, the success rate's very low. Um, but the upside is huge. So like not just financially, but also like quality of life and enjoyment, you know, like um, I, I have some stuff that I've written in my book about like the, the relationship between money and happiness and everyone has their own curve and all that. And my curve's pretty flat, like, you know, making more money doesn't really make me happier. Um, but I still love trading and I love writing about trading just because it's like a, it's an interesting puzzle that's constantly yeah. changing and it's fun. And like, I guess the money is, is like a measuring rod or whatever, like a video game has a score and trading can sometimes be like that. Um, yeah. But then also like it is re still real, you know, like it's not like a video game because it's connected to the real world in different ways, although less connected than it used to be, I guess, um, like financial markets and the, and the real world have been drifting apart for the last 15 years. So.
Yeah. Now, one of the things I'm curious about, um, again, just kind of from a selfish perspective and my own curiosity. Yeah. So when I was trading FX, it felt like longer time frames were very difficult for me to align with, to figure out where things were most likely to go. I'm sure it's a good amount of experience that I was missing for that. But I, what led me closer to equities was it felt more forgiving, um, where things I could swing trade or even trade, you know, like I, I like to trade options, like I was telling you. So I'll have leaps diagonals on that I manage in six to nine months. Right. And I, I've had pretty good success with those kinds of things in FX. I felt like I could never find that. So I would be curious just to understand your perspective on time frames that you would think more people could be successful in if they were trading FX or even from your own experience, like what time frames you prefer the most? Yeah. So my time frame is much shorter. Um, yeah. And like a time frame is a really important question. Like part of it is personality. So if you're not like if you're a patient person who like tends to over or sorry impatient person who tends to over trade you know like uh, that's going to be obviously more suited to shorter time horizons and then if you're mm -hmm. like sort of like a patient mature wise person like you are that it sounds like then you're a longer time frame would Not be true well like i don't know you found your way of, of <laughs> no, I get it. holding on to things and stuff then a longer time frame works i think philosophically for me so generally like my average holding period is about two days, but it varies from like one hour to two months. Like it's that wide, yeah. but, um, and mostly if I'm doing longer stuff, it's through options. Um, but a lot of it has to do with like understanding what is signal and what's noise on your specific time horizon. So like people have these macro views, like Oh, the, you know, Russia sanctions mean China's going to switch out of treasuries into gold. So I'm going to be long gold, but then their stop is like 4% below the market or whatever. And like, so that would be a timing mismatch of like a super macro trade with a stop loss, like 1.5 days ranges away. Right. Um, so I think that's a mistake that a lot of people make is the combination of like leverage, tightness of stop and like trying to make X amount of money or whatever doesn't always fit with the, with the thesis or the time horizon that they're trading. Um, but generally I find, and so this is just like a philosophical thing to me, but when you think about something like a, a very, very complex system, like markets or like weather or whatever, I feel like the more you go out and, and like, it's interesting because this obviously isn't consistent with your, your experience, but my experience is that like, sometimes I feel like I can basically see what's going to happen before it's happening for like a day or two. And then I try to hold on to it for another day and another day. And then, uh, and then I end up giving the whole thing back. So whatever it is that, edge that I have that where I can like, see, like, I feel like I can see the future because of probably pattern recognition and, sure. and stuff like that. It seems to dissipate after about two days. And like my, I keep a lot of data on my trading data on my trading and it supports that as well. Um, and actually just one takeaway for people watching is if you keep data on your trading, you'll learn 80% of the stuff you, you find in the data will be like, yeah, I knew that I lose money in the afternoons or whatever, but there'll be a few nuggets in there where you're like, whoa, like, I didn't know that. Like I had no idea. And actually I said the losing money in the afternoons thing. So when I worked, I worked at a hedge fund for a few years and I used to snap my PL every 30 minutes and FX is very busy when London's in and then it tends to fizzle after that. So 7 a.m. or really like 6 a.m. New York till 11 a.m. is like the good time to trade FX. And like everyone knows that. And, you know, I knew that I probably shouldn't trade in the afternoon, but then I started snapping my PL every 30 minutes. And basically like if you just normalize it to like, maximum PL, like this is starting PL, then that's maximum. The maximum was at 11. And then I was losing between 11 and 5 PM. I was losing about 35% of my PL, like on average. So like, yeah, I knew that afternoons weren't great to trade, but then when I saw that, I'm like, that's like a lot of money or, you know, you yeah. made a percentage at a hedge fund. So that's like real money. That's, you know, it, it, it registered for the first time in my mind, like 
okay, I really have to like pretty much square up at 11 or like reduce my position, reduce my risk to 20% of what it was or whatever. Um, and so very like a specific, I mean, that's a pretty specific thing that I learned, but whatever data people can keep, um, like a, a journal, like in is generally people think of a trading journal as like words and, and thoughts and all that, but also like keeping, like I got in at this time out at this time depends on your frequency. Like if you're doing 200 trades a day, then that's not realistic. And then your data has right. to be on a, like your granularity has to be daily levels. But if you're doing like four trades a day, you can keep track pretty specifically. And then you can start to see, um, and you, you can start to get information about like, oh, whenever I do options beyond a month, like, so that's what one thing I started noticing was like, I used to do a lot of options that were pretty short. And I noticed like one week options at the end of the year, one week options were making me a lot of money and overnight options were, were killing, like were super negative. And there's kind of like a reason for that in the market in FX, like this is boring, so I won't get into it, but generally overnight options are very expensive because nobody wants sure. to sell them. Yeah. Um, probably the same thing in equities, right? As you, yeah. as you get to like the stupid short time horizons, nobody wants to sell that thing because the leverage is too crazy. So if you're systematically buying those things, you're losing money. So I would just encourage your, your peeps to just keep as detailed as you, as within reason. Um, yeah. And then, so the interesting thing is like, just sit there and collect it for three months. And then after three months or whatever, go look at it and go like, okay, what, you know, what can I learn here? You don't have to constantly be checking back on it. Like most of my trip, most of my data, I just have it in a sheet. And like, I look at it once a quarter and I go, cause I, especially now I kind of know what it's going to say. Um, but then sometimes you're like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm surprised. Like, you know, I, every single option I did like this quarter lost money and all my spot trades made money. Like sometimes it's even something that obvious you don't realize. So, well, and I feel like there's a ton of value in that. I actually do a segment right now. It's called teaching to trade. I, I like took four random people from my audience and we meet each week and we record sessions together, essentially just about like learning our skill set together. Okay. Yeah. And one of the big things is trade logs. I'm a huge advocate of trade documentation. And especially when I think people are early on in their journey, it even starts to give you information in terms of like what's important to track. And then mm. over time you can cut out things like, you know, for options. I originally tracked all of the first order and second order Greeks. Super overkill did not need to happen. And I don't do that anymore. But now I know that if I'm trading, you know, two week options row doesn't really matter that much. However, for really long term stuff, especially during a year like this, when interest rates are moving, row is now important. And we know yeah, that, yeah. you know, from reviewing that kind of data. So yeah, I, I love that you mentioned that, especially because I, I do feel like there's such a paradox with retail trading. It's so easy to enter now, even Robin hood, you know, they like gamify it. It's literally a game yeah, now. Yeah. And it just, a lot of people feel like, well, you could just walk onto the field and play this game and be successful. And, you know, as you rightfully pointed out, it's statistically speaking, like literally not the case. It's just not yeah, how this, this whole thing so works. I, it, my, my main, like I have two books, but my first one's just about FX trading. And my second one's more about trading in general. But in the first couple of chapters of that book, I kind of go into like success rates and like what it takes to succeed and, and all that kind of stuff in trading. And the the thing about trading is that it's like online poker or, or like professional poker. Like anyone can go sit down. Right. Um, but like, I think it's really important to understand, like not necessarily on day one, like nobody has an edge on day one. Sure. Um, but to like be kind of looking at like, okay, what's my edge going to be? Because there's a lot of like, I don't want to say like get rich quick, but I guess it, that's what it is, right? It's get, yeah. get rich quick kind of mentality of like technical formations that are generally like what a lot of companies will do is like back test a bunch of things, find some things that work and then market the success rate of those things. But out of sample, they don't work. They just worked, you know, it's data mining kind of thing. And so like there is, in my opinion, and I can pretty much say this like with 100% certainty, there's no easy way to trade. Like there's no, like you draw a line on a thing and when it breaks, you sell it and then you make money. Right. Consistently. If that was a thing, first of all, like that, it isn't a thing, but if it everybody was everybody would do it, there'd be computers doing it and yep. there are computers doing it, you know? So like 
the simplest, the very simplest things don't exist as profitable, like alpha generating strategies. Yeah. But the thing is though, also is that I don't feel like the level of complexity has to be like insanely higher either. Like a simple strategy of trying to determine when people are panicking and doing the opposite. Like that's kind of what Renaissance technologies did for a long time, right? Is just finding like a basic inefficiency in the market and then trying to capitalize on it. So like there used to be things like sometimes head headlines used to be like that, right? It's just there's an a, there's like a equilibrium asymmetry where for 15 seconds a headline comes out and the price discovery happens. And if you're really fast, like that was one of the things I did in 99 in the 90s was I was just really fast because I played a lot of video games. And so something came out and I just bam, bam, bam. And, and then I was, I was out as the other people were trying to buy on the headline that were slow. You know what I mean? I was selling to those guys. Right. So that can be like an edge can be that simple. Um, but like having some understanding of like, why should you be able to make money is, and sometimes I think you can figure it out, right? Like somebody notices like, oh, these SPACs are mispriced or like, they, you know, the when the lockup happens on these IPOs, there's a two week window where the stock goes down and like, that's a violation of efficient markets, but the flow is bigger than the, the buy and nobody's buying for those two weeks. And so like, right. you know, there, there's, to me, there's like, the market is extremely efficient um, on like most time frames, but there's all these millions of little inefficiencies constantly yes. happening. And if you're good, you, you're not really like, you don't have to be some like George Soros macro genius savant. You just find these, like, if you become really good at your thing, your, your, your currency or your whatever, your, your stock, you start to see little inefficiencies or like, oh, if you have level two, like when this person's buying, you know, it always seems to tick like 30, 30 cents higher, right? You just start seeing patterns. And um, so uh, my point, my original point was that there's a lot of marketing and stuff of like super simple methodologies, um, usually involving charts and texts and breakouts and stuff like that. And they don't work. So I'm just telling yep. people don't do that. Cause it's, it's it like, and you're better off. I think you said actually in the a video that I was just watching before, like don't spend your money on that thing. Put like, if you're going to spend 15 grand on a course or whatever, put like five grand in a, in a trading account and buy like a thousand dollars worth of books and read all those books and you'll get way more out of it. Um, a lot of the like courses and stuff, or you were talking about discord. Um, yeah, games, but, but like there's, a, you, you know, there's, there's definitely very good products out there, but sure. in general, I think like you can probably have just as good odds teaching yourself because the incentives are aligned when you're teaching yourself. And if, you're buying a course that it's not guaranteed that the incentives are aligned. But anyways, I didn't mean to come on here and talk about trading courses, but. <laughs> no, I, 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 again, literally, that's why I love these conversations. They go wherever they go. And I think there's like goodness, like literally in all of that, because one of my, my biggest heartaches is a lot of these courses that are marketing it, you know, I always find it to be so important to like work backwards from an entity and understand the incentive. If I am a trading course, what is my larger audience treating like preaching a really hard, long process to be profitable or this two simple strategies that works 80% of the time? Right, right. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, it's yeah. inherent in the way that the marketing works. And that's actually... I've started a bit of a crusade against win rate and everybody wants to talk about win rate and probability of profit, which I like, but it's something that my mentor actually drilled into my head early on is expectancy, expectancy. You can right. have a very low win rate, not very low. You still have to win sometimes, but you can yeah. have a low, relatively low win rate, but still be profitable. It's an extreme example, but the point being, there's two parts to this equation that matter. You can also have a 95% win rate that's not profitable. And that like, yeah. that doesn't sell well, you know, even the idea Actually, of expectancy. You know, that's an interesting thing that came out of, so like in, I, I started keeping real data all the time after I read this book by um, Ken Grant called uh, Trading Risk. Yep, um, I've read one it. One of the few like really good risk management books. But um, so I had already been trading for like 10 years at that point, And I never had kept data before. 
And that was one thing that really surprised me was I was keeping data mostly, most of my data that I keep is just daily. Like, so I just keep track of my like yeah. up, up, down, high, low of the day and all that. And my win rate is basically always between like 50 and 53%. And then my p &L is all based on the ratio. Like, is it 1.7 yeah. to one or like, you know, in a really bad year, it could be like basically where you're flat. It'd be obviously one to one and 50% kind of thing. But the thing that I, the, so like there's the two levers, like you said, right? There's win percentage and there's the ratio of up to down. And I always found any kind of tweaks and stuff that I did, bare, I could never really change my win percentage. The, everything was always more to do with, you know, like running winners and, and discipline yes. on stops and all that yeah. all influences this thing. But win percentage is just like your edge and your edge is like, kind of goes up and down but it doesn't go up and down all that much the edge comes from uh or your your prediction capability or whatever your edge comes right. from, from monetizing the good ideas and getting out of the bad ideas and i know that's kind of like it's a truism and it's kind of like mathematical common sense but it's interesting to see it because like i think i would have guessed probably because like everyone probably overestimates their skill as well i probably would have guessed my win rate win rate was like 60 percent or something and then knowing it was only 50% and how stable it was after year, after year, after like five years, I'm like, my win percentage doesn't even move basically. And some years I'm making them tons and one year I was flat. Um, so I found that really interesting. And then, you know, it kind of changes your focus a little bit on like, where do you want to put your energy? Um, and obviously the energy should be devoted in more like not cutting too early and, and things like that, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a big nerd when it comes to reading white papers and studies on retail trading and like Barber and Odin, they do a bunch. Um, so I'm, I'm, I read their stuff all the time. They're from um, Berkeley and they yep. do, you know, just all different kinds of studies. And one of the really normal effects for retail traders is we tend to let losers run and we cut winners too short. And I think that feeds right into kind of the broader conversation around why high win rates are so appealing is there's just, there's a lot of ego involved in this space for a lot of people until they learn that like ego loses money. As soon mm. as like, I feel like a retail trader gets to that conclusion, you're so much better off. But early on, you know, it's, you don't want to admit you're wrong. And when you do have a trade that's winning, even if it's just a little bit, that's a winner. That feels good. Yeah, you know, you're like, we, sweet. Yeah. We, we want to take that down. But then there goes yeah. expectancy. You know, letting losers run, cutting winners short equals negative expectancy. Yeah. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left. And we we were, this is like literally the same conversation. But I, I do want to get your like explicit thoughts on it. When we're thinking about the risk to reward spectrum for retail traders before, you know, we were discussing that there's a, you know, a bit of a scale and it's important to figure out where we are on that scale as individuals. Yep. There's kind of two questions I have for you for retail traders that are watching this. How would they best determine where on that scale they are? And then based on where they are in that scale, what kind of adjustments would you be making if you were in their shoes? Let's say if they're, um, low risk, low return, high risk, high return. And then in the middle, you know, just for like some perspective ideas. So I think interestingly, um, well, I hope, um, the, the sort <laughs> of, so, the solutions for, um, both ends of the spectrum are really about having some kind of rules-based approach that is consistent. And the good thing about having rules too, is that, you know, like if you, if you're doing well, it makes it less likely that it's luck um, because it's right. repeatable, right? You're not just like coming in and hitting buttons and like, oh, I made money six days in a row. Well, it doesn't really mean anything because you might blow up on, on day seven. Right. But if you have like a systematic approach. So I think in general, whether you're like, the, you, the, I know the first part of the question was like, how do you know? I, I think most people just know. Like, I think in general, you know, if you, first of all, you need to know basically what your risk management strategy is like how, what percentage of capital are you risking on your trades and and that kind of stuff like you need a basic here's my framework and here's my spreadsheet and if i lose money 10 days in a row here's what's going to happen i think you everyone has to have that and then the question just becomes like are you pushing against the edge of that every single day 
Um, or are you like, say you're let like, just for whatever, just pick whatever number, but like, say your max loss, at, at, let's say at a bank. So say I have a trader that's working for me and she's not supposed to lose more than 50 grand a day. And she's losing like 15 and then nine and 16 and stuff. Then I'm like, okay, dude, you, you're not like, you should be hitting your limit once in a while, very rarely, but you should be hitting it. Um, and then the other person is like hitting it four times a week. That's obviously the, the, the other extreme. So I think what you do is like you establish your bound, your boundaries, right? Whatever, like my max loss, yep. um, like, you know, what my good day is going to be relative to my bad day. And then you start to see like, how often am I testing that? And like, if you have say like a retail trader and again, like, I don't want to get into the nuances of like percent of risk per trade and all that. It's just such a too sure. long conversation, but let's just say, let's say you have a hundred grand in your account and every trade you do, you're risking two grand. That's like a simple methodology. Sure. Then if you're losing four grand once a week, like obviously that's a risk management problem. But if you're losing like 800, 600 and 200 and like, you know, barely ever losing more than a thousand, then you're probably not maximizing like, and you're doing okay. You're probably not maximizing your, your upside because you're not, you're not touching the guardrails at all. So like, I think having like a really clear idea in your mind, okay, these are, this is what, like, if I'm doing well, this is what it's going to look like. And you can do simulations and stuff like that too. Like I've changed capital amounts like crazy. Like I, you know, I was trading my own money. I was trading a hedge fund with like hundreds of million dollars of millions of dollars. And then at a bank where different banks have different risk tolerances. So I've had like wildly different amounts of risk. So each time I kind of always establish like, okay, like a bad day is this, a good day is this, max bad day is this. And then on a weekly, monthly basis kind of looks like this. And I know I make money like 50% of days. And you can start to build little spreadsheets that kind of do like simulations and then kind of get an idea of like, okay, you know, re also reverse engineering targets and reverse engineering, like, okay, I'm bankrupt. If this happens, um, you can start to get an idea of your like daily guardrails and, and, and weekly. And I think what you want to do is occasionally be testing those bounds on the really, when you have a really bad run, you should be getting close to whatever the like worst case for that say your weekly loss limit is. Um, and then to me though, it's all about rules. So like whether you work at a bank or for yourself or whatever, to me, the scary times for me have always been when I'm not following my own rules. Cause then you don't really know what's going to happen. Cause you're, you're the one pushing the buttons and you don't even know if you're going to stop or not. To me, right. that's like being in that position is, is scary. Um, and to avoid that, what I've always done, like for many years is every time I put a position on, cause my, like I was saying at the start, um, like my self-control discipline has never been that great is I automate everything. So like, you know, I buy 10 million euros. It, as soon as I do that, I just put a stop lot, wherever my stop is, I put it on a computer. Cause like in FX, you can automate everything. And most yeah. markets you can. Yeah. And I, I usually always, almost always put my take profit as well. Yep. And then I try my hardest to not touch it. And, you know, and I, I'm, I'm pretty good now because a lot more steps are required to like actively cancel a stop, move it down and all that. But what, if you don't have it automated, it's, it doesn't require that much effort to go, oh, it was at 90. Let me just move. I'll, I'll stop out at 80. You know, it looks kind of bid here. I'll just wait till it gets to 70. And then all of a sudden, like you're selling at 52 on the way. Yeah. Down, you know? So um, whereas if you have a thing in a system to go in and actually change, it requires a lot more active engagement. So, um, yeah, so all of that to say, I think like you develop your kind of like range, hopefully you're touching both sides of that range occasionally. Um, and like you have a good understanding of what your standard deviation is in that range. And then it's all rules based and there's no like there's no oops factor because everything you're doing has like a pretty simple set of rules and there's a spreadsheet and you have yeah. conditional formatting like for when you break your limit, it turns red and you don't have too many red cells on the spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. It's actually one of the things I'm doing with that teaching to trade segment right now is, is having conversations with them about creating those rules. That's actually a fun follow on. Obviously we, we don't have time to discuss it too far in this, this call. I'd love to talk to you another time about it though, because I find sure. for newer traders, 
um, especially the four that I'm working with right now, they have a hard time. Um, well, let's take a step back. Most retail traders have no rules for themselves. It's Lord of the Flies. Yeah, so for the smaller subset that does acknowledge that rules are helpful, structure serves them well, it gives them something to make adjustments off of in a quantitative manner. Some yes. of them have a hard time even understanding where to make a rule, right? right if you don't know right. what you don't know. And yeah. that's actually what I'm working a lot with them on right now. Um, so like I said, definitely would be fun to pick your brain on that in, in the future. But I think one of the most important things that I really want to echo that you mentioned is, you know, as we were talking about the, this risk to reward spectrum, you were talking about having some spreadsheets that you can review. And I think that's for most people who have a hard time understanding the right risk and reward for themselves. That's the first place to start is logging, having data right. to look at, because exactly, otherwise, yeah. how could you possibly make any decisions? And so like, I don't, I don't mean to make this sound like super complex either. <laughs> Essentially it's, it's not like what I do isn't very complicated. It's just basic. I, I think the, the number one reason you have to have some rules about like max daily loss and all that is that you're going to blow up otherwise, like, you know, yes. eventually you, you know, you take your account from 30 grand to 200 grand. And like, I saw people do this and you don't have any guardrails and you go from 200 to hundred. And yep. then you're like, Oh, well, like now I'm like, I've already lost hundred. I might as well just let it ride. And then all of a sudden you're like, you owe the firm 28 grand because you busted your margin or whatever. So like, and also it gives you um, control of your drawdown so that like you don't yeah. go from 30 K to 200 K to 30 K. Cause that's obviously a common pattern as well. Is that like, you really shouldn't be drawing down, you know, whatever that is, 86% of your, of your capital at, at, yeah. at, at any time. Um, so just having like a super basic rule of like, you know, 10% from peak I cut or whatever, like any, any basically one rule that's going to stop you from blowing up is like the starting point. And then you can layer on more, a little bit more complexity, but um, it, there's, there's a lot of interesting things. Like I, I know it's kind of time to go, but like even keeping the track of your high and low, like if you're kind of like an intraday trader, um, your, your time horizon, this might not work, but for people that are trading more like intraday, just keeping track of your low of day and high of day. Sometimes you might notice like, oh, I, whenever I get to two grand, I always like shit the bed and end up flat, you know? And that there's a lot of people have that as well. Like Yeah, because kind of they like think a, they have house money. Yeah, so it's house money effect. And then it's also partly... Um, of a mathematical, I've noticed this in FX, it's a mathematical output of how big your positions are and how volatile the instrument that you trade is, is that if you, you know, if you're taking $10 million positions and your thing moves 1% a day, you're going to start to notice like whenever you're up a hundred grand that you tend to peak out because your product mean reverts at that point. And right. so your PL is showing you that. Um, so anyways, there, there's a lot of ways you can, you can extract information from the data. Um, but like just keeping a simple open, high, low close of your PL, I think is like a super easy way to start. I love that. And that's literally a perfect note to end on. I think that's a great, great piece of advice. So um, first off, on behalf of, you know, myself and everybody else that's watching this, thank you, you know, for taking some time to, to you know, just bullshit with me, talk about trading a little bit. I, I always find these conversations, I enjoy them. I get to learn. And I think that a lot of other people get to pick up, you know, different skills here and there. So thank you for sharing some of your experience with us. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. Awesome, brother. Well, love to have you on again in the future. And until sure. next time, we'll Anytime. see you later. All right.